Hi, welcome to St. Stephen's Sunday Forum. Uh, we are beginning a three-week series with Professor Jeff Leonard from the Department of Biblical and Religious Studies at Samford. And we are following a creation theme, actually over the next four weeks. Uh, Professor Leonard will be with us the next three, and then we'll have Will Kynes for a fourth week on the theme, uh, Tracing Creation Through um, Biblical Texts. And so, welcome, Jeff Leonard. <laughs> Hines is a friend and colleague, and he speaks very highly of all of you. He says that you rarely ever throw stones at him when he says something, and he was protected by the Zoom screen in any case, uh, so uh, I, I'm counting on that. Um, I, I love the topic that we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks. Um, it, uh, when I was approached and the issue was about creation care, creation is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I actually uh, published a book on the subject last year, which uh, when I bought copies for my sons for Christmas, it moved on Amazon just above the repair manual for the 1974 Gremlin. Um, and so I, I am aiming high, um, but uh, it's, uh, it is a subject that I care a great deal about and certainly care about uh, creation itself. Uh, my opening illustration uh, in the book is talking about a moment when we are uh, camping in Yosemite that we have arrived at a place that's called Snow Creek Falls, which overlooks the, uh, the Yosemite Valley, and just across the way is Half Dome. And we had arrived just in time for sunset to take place there. And as you see, this riot of colors uh, that is displayed on this beautiful granite canvas, it just you know leaps up in your heart. There has to be a God. Uh, creation is one of the ways that God reveals himself to us. And so I'm delighted to be able to talk about that subject. Well, what we're going to talk about today uh, is the, the topic of Eden. Uh, echoes of Eden, heaven and earth touch in a garden. You know, paradise is a, it's sort of a cultural icon for us. We have so many different uh, versions of it. There are heavenly paradises that you know about. You've certainly heard of Nirvana or Valhalla or uh, to, to tap into the Greeks, the Elysian fields uh, where we hope to go. Uh, there are earthly paradises as well. Uh, so you have heard, for example, of El Dorado, the, uh, the mythical city of gold in South America, or Shangri-La, uh, this legendary valley of peace in the mountains of Tibet. If you want a more uh, modern example, you could think of Rivendell. Uh, Rivendell in Tolkien's writings certainly fills that spot. The, uh, the, the wonderful poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge has one that I think is quite interesting, his poem Kubla Khan. In Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree where Alf, the sacred river, ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round, and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree. And here were forests ancient as the hills in folding sunny spots of greenery. This famous poem, it's so famous, and it, it, it's interesting because it taps into an element that was quite common in the ancient Near East, and that's the notion of a royal garden. So here Kublai Khan has uh, decreed the construction of this pleasure dome, and it describes all of the elements that make it this royal garden. This is a very common motif in Mesopotamia. There uh, is an old Persian word, which you know of, as paradise. This is a word that gets its start uh, in what today would be Iran, and it moves its way west into the Semitic languages, like the, the languages of Babylon and Assyria. It becomes the word pardesu. You can still hear that echo of paradise in there, right? Pardesu. It will even make its way over into Hebrew as the word pardes. Pardes, the word for paradise. What it originally is, though, it's not really a, a mythical notion of an idea of paradise. What it really is, is it's just a walled royal garden. And gardens were especially important in the place called Assyria. So if you think about uh, modern-day Iraq, the southern part of Iraq is Babylon. 
the northern part of Iraq is Assyria. And while Babylon gets all the credit for the hanging gardens, the truth is the gardens were far more important in the northern part of the country in Assyria than they were in the south. If you go to the British Museum, for example, you will find all over the near eastern section of the museum these uh, stone posters called bas-reliefs. And on many of those posters, what they have carved are the gardens from Assyria. There was a famous king by the name of Tiglot Pileser I, and he imported trees and created this garden there around the palace. He actually put a, a small pleasure palace right in the midst of the garden. The famous king Sennacherib created his own botanical garden in the city of Nineveh. He, he filled it with aromatic plants and with fruit trees and olives and uh, vineyards, and he, he had a game preserve that was there. And his grandson, uh, Ashurbanipal, it's really the pictures of his garden that lined the halls of the British Museum. Gardens were very important in Assyria. Pardes is a, a word that comes from Persia, and it made its way back to Persia in the form of Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great was a true emperor. In fact, he may be the first true emperor. His kingdom was vast. It stretched all the way up to Europe and over into the Indus Valley. Uh, Cyrus the Great is the one who conquered Babylon. He's the one that you know of from that moment in the book of Daniel when there's the writing on the wall at Belshazzar's feast where it says, Mini, mini, tekel, ufarsin, you have been weighed, you have been found wanting, and your kingdom is divided. It's Cyrus who's going to come in on the heels of that, uh, that legendary feast there. This is the way Cyrus describes himself in the Cyrus Cylinder. I am you'll see that humility was among his many great gifts. I am Cyrus, king of the world, great king, mighty king, king of Babylon, king of Sumer and Akkad, king of the four quarters, son of Cambyses, great king, king of Anshan, grandson of Cyrus, great king. king. He keeps peppering it with that great king line as if he's trying to make a point. Uh, of an eternal line of kingship whose rule Marduk and Nabu love, whose kingship they desire for their heart's pleasure. He, he was quite a humble fellow. And he built a capital. Now, it's interesting, the capital that he built, the, when they talk about ruins in Persia, what they usually talk about is a place called Susa Persopolis. Um, if you think about that last word, Persopolis, Pers, Persian, Polis, Persia city uh, is the name that's given to it. But Cyrus built his capital in a place called Pasargadai, and it was meant to be a garden capital. He, he built the garden. He had limestone uh, irrigation channels that were made. The garden was actually quite organized and had four quadrants to represent the four corners of the earth. And in his garden, he set a throne, a throne where he could rule over this garden and by extension ruling over the rest of the world. Pasargadai is the place that Cyrus built. Well, I mentioned before, this word pardes makes its way over into Hebrew. There are three places in the Hebrew Bible where the word pardes is used. Uh, in one, in the book of Nehemiah, when uh, Nehemiah is on his way back, he talks to King Xerxes. Who, this is that story where Xerxes sees him, and he, he's sad, and he says, why are you sad? Well, because Jerusalem is still in ruins, and he says, well, what can I do for you? And so he wants to get permission to travel back, and when he does, he says, can you give me a letter? that I can give to your keeper of the forest, whose name is Asaf. Well, the keeper of the forest, the word forest, is the word pardes. It's the keeper of the park is the idea. When the preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes uh, tries to find meaning in all of the Epicurean pleasures of life, one of the things that he says is, I made great works I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks. That's that word pardes again. Planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I had made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. The last one is in the book of Song of Songs. This is by far the most provocative context here. As uh, if you read Song of Songs 4, uh, which I sometimes force my students to do, the, the male lover extols the beauties of his female lover, and he begins with her face and her head, works his way down past her breast, and then finally in verse 13, I didn't write it, I'm just the messenger, says, um, having 
worked his way down. Your channel is an orchard of pomegranates with all choices, fruits, henna, and nard. We'll move on quickly from that. But uh, the, the word for orchard there is, again, the word pardes. It's that word that is the word for paradise. Royal gardens were a very big topic in uh, Assyria, in Babylon, and they make their way over to be an important topic in the Bible as well. But, you know, there's a second strand of tradition related to gardens. One is that strand of tradition about the royal gardens. The other is about the divine garden. And so if you're in Mesopotamia, there's a, a, a legend or a myth that's called uh, Enki and Ninhursag. This is a Sumerian story, and there's a place called Dilmun. And in Dilmun, the, the god who controls fresh water, Enki, he sends his fresh waters, and that is what gives life to Dilmun and turns it into a flourishing garden and city. The reason Dilmun is so interesting is because it's a place that comes up in the Sumerian story of the flood. So there's a, uh, there are Mesopotamian versions of the flood story. Many of you probably heard of these before, but uh, basically what happens is the gods create humans to do their work, but the humans, they multiply too much and they're making too much noise and the gods decide that they're going to kill them. Well, one of the gods, again, Enki, realizes this is a very bad plan because if they kill the humans, the gods are going to have to start doing the work again. And so Enki warns this character whose name is Ziusudra. He's basically the Babylonian or Sumerian, in this case, Noah. He says, build a boat and get on that boat and you'll survive the flood. When he does, the gods realize that Ziusudra and his family have survived and they're at first angry, but then later their, their hearts are appeased by Enki when he explains what he's done. And so they give to Ziasudra immortality, and they set him to live in this place called Dilmun. This issue of immortality comes up in the other main place where we have the Babylonian flood story. It's in the, Gil, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. If you know the Epic of Gilgamesh, here is our, our hero. He's the king of Uruk, and he's, he's sort of terrorizing his own town. And so they pray for relief, and that relief comes in the form of a companion for him, Enkidu. And when Enkidu comes, they set off and they, they do their exploits elsewhere instead of just terrorizing his own town. The problem is Enkidu dies. And this has a profound effect on Gilgamesh because Enkidu was his sort of mirror image and he realizes if Enkidu can die, so can I. And so he sets off in this quest for immortality. Well, where that finally leads him is into the, the tunnel that the sun travels each day to get from the west back to the east. I, you, you know, it, things didn't work differently in the ancient world. The sun goes overhead. They didn't realize the world was round. And so instead of having a, you know, cosmological tennis match of the sun going back and forth like this each day, what it, what it would do is it would go from the east over to the west and then travel through a tunnel to get back to the east. And so this is the tunnel that Gilgamesh races through ahead of the sun. It's in pitch darkness until the very end as the sun is catching up to him and he just makes it through. And when he arrives on the other side, he finds himself in a divine garden. And when he's in that divine garden, the trees and the fruits are made of jewels. Everything is made of jewels there. It's this divine garden that's really not suited for human consumption. But there's, a, there's another little connection in there. There is something that is suited to it. Gilgamesh is after immortality. And he goes over to this island where Utnapishtim, a man whose name means found life. He's the Babylonian version of Ziasudra. He's this Babylonian Noah. He makes his way over there and says, how in the world can I get immortality? Well, Utnapishtim tells him the story of the flood and says, I'm sorry, there's really no good way for you to do it. I just happened to survive the flood, and how's that going to happen a second time? So Gilgamesh is at his wit's end. He gets in the boat to go back across from the island, and that's when Utnapishtim tells him, well, there, there is one thing you could do. If you swim down to the bottom of the ocean, there's a plant. And if you pick that plant and eat from the plant, then you'll gain immortality. So he keeps the plant with him. He doesn't eat from the plant just yet. He's making his way back to Uruk. He's hot. It's a desert. He sets the plant down, takes a swim, and an animal comes and eats the plant, robbing him of immortality. You know what the animal is. It's a serpent. 
It's a serpent that comes and eats the plant and robs Gilgamesh of his immortality. Of course, it's a serpent that would do this and take it, which is why actually they thought that serpents were immortal. Because they don't die, they just shed their skins and are reborn is the, the notion that they had there. It is well nigh impossible not to hear echoes of these uh, Sumerian, Babylonian, and Assyrian motifs in the Bible's Eden story. All over the place we see these, for example, the trees. Um, just as the Assyrian kings gathered to themselves this botanical garden of trees, listen to this line from Genesis 2, out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it's not just in Genesis that you find this connection between Eden and trees. Uh, Eden actually comes up several other times in the Bible. Twice it comes up in Ezekiel. Listen to this line from Ezekiel 31 as it describes Assyria as having been in the Garden of Eden. Consider Assyria a cedar of Lebanon. With fair branches and forest shade and of great height, its top among the clouds, it towered high above all the trees of the fields. Its boughs grew large and its branches long from abundant water in its shoots. The cedars in the garden of God could not rival it, nor the fir trees equal its boughs. The plane trees were as nothing compared with its branches. No tree in the garden of God was like it in beauty. I made it beautiful with its massive branches, the envy of all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God. When Ezekiel describes Eden, the element that he picks out is so important is the trees that were there, just like the trees in Gilgamesh's royal or divine garden that he finds, just like in Pasargadai, just like in the Assyrian gardens, the trees. There's also the waters. This is a key element of those Assyrian stories, is the construction of those irrigation systems that they made. They actually wrote inscriptions on the irrigation systems to lay claim to having done it. It's the same for Cyrus's Pasargadai as he makes these beautiful limestone uh, irrigation channels. In Dilmun, it's the waters of Enki that bring life. In Ezekiel, concerning the tree, the waters nourished it. The deep made it grow tall, making its rivers flow around the place it was planted, sending forth its streams to all the trees of the field, it's the waters. And the waters come up in Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, it says concerning Eden, a water, excuse me, a river flows out of Eden to water the garden. And from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is Pishon. It's the one that flows around the whole land of Havilah where there's gold. The gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second is Gihon. It's the one that flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth is the Euphrates. It's this emphasis on these life-giving waters that flow out of Eden. So what about the jewels? Well, if you go back to Ezekiel, again we find the jewels. In that second uh, example of uh, Ezekiel talking about the Garden of Eden, he talks about the king of Tyre. And the way he describes him is, you were in Eden. The garden of God, every precious stone was your covering. Carnelian and chrysolite and moonstone, beryl and onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald, worked in gold were your settings and your engravings on the day that you were created. With an anointed cherub as guardian, I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked among the stones of fire. And of course, there's the issue of immortality. You can't miss the connection between the immortality lost to the serpent in the Epic of Gilgamesh and the serpent that steals away the immortality from the couple in the garden. Um, there's another really interesting connection, though, and it has to do with the tree of life. So in Assyrian iconography, one of their main repeated symbols of royalty is a stylized tree called the tree of life. And from the way that they use it, you can tell that that tree often stands in in the spot where there's supposed to be a god. In other words, what the tree is doing is the tree is sort of representing the deity. The tree is representing the divine world order. And at times, the king stands in for where the tree is supposed to be. 
In other words, it's not just that the tree sometimes represents the gods as the, the embodiment of the divine world order. Sometimes it's the king who stands in as the representative of gods. Both of these elements are present in Eden. The tree of life is the conduit for God to share blessings and immortality with the couple. And then in another sense, it's the couple themselves who stand in for God who are sort of the king and queen of this new creation, they are the representatives on earth. Remember I mentioned in the flood story that the reason that the Mesopotamians have the gods create humans is to do the work of the gods. So God plants a garden, and what does he want the humans to do? Tend the garden. They are the stand-ins for God. The Eden story never describes this place as a pardes. It never describes it using that term, but it didn't take very long for readers of the Bible to apply that term to it. When the Jewish community at Alexandria, Egypt, translated the scriptures into Greek, the word that they used to translate the garden in the Garden of Eden was the word paradisos. It's the Greek form of pardes. It's the word paradise. When they described Eden, they described it as a paradise. Now, truthfully, describing Eden as a paradise, it tends to overshadow some important elements that are in the story. But it also does highlight some other elements in the story. Because what it underscores is that in the Bible, Eden is not a story of paradise. It's a story of paradise lost. That is the key for the Eden story. Every Eden story in the Bible is a story of paradise lost. If you turn back to Ezekiel 28 and you read the story of the king of Tyre, he is this cherub who's in Eden on the mountain of God. But what happens? God casts the king of Tyre out of this garden. In the abundance of your trade, the text says, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. This uh, reflex of the story of Eden is a story of paradise that's lost. The same thing happens with Assyria. When in Ezekiel 31 it talks about, No tree in the garden of God was like it in beauty. I made it beautiful with the mass of its branches. The envy of all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because it towered high and set its top among the clouds and its heart was proud in its height, I gave it into the hand of the prince of nations. He has dealt with it as its wickedness deserve. I have cast it out. It's another Eden story. What, what it really tells us is that there was a, a story, uh, this some sort of mythical story that was back in the background, and we have that story bubble to the surface in different places in Scripture. It bubbles to the surface in one place for the king of Tyre in Ezekiel, in another place for Assyria, and then it does again in Genesis 2 and 3 as it's describing this paradise lost that is Eden. The notion of a paradise lost is one that we are surely familiar with. Uh, it's one that it comes up a lot in the Romantic period. Uh, if you think about it, uh, you know, Rousseau and Gauguin and Matisse, all of them went to Tahiti because their thought was that civilization is what had ruined, um, you know, humanity's innocence. And if they could just go back to Tahiti, they would be able to find humanity in its innocence and rediscover that paradise. Of course, it, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, Gauguin's painting, uh, you know, who are we, where are we from, where are we going, um, is the, the most vivid example of that, is it seems to start with paradise, but ends with this, you know, terrible bleak scene, at the end of which uh, Gauguin attempted suicide uh, when he had finished making the painting, because he saw that even Tahiti would not really give paradise back. If you uh, are familiar with the films of Terrence Malick, uh, he's uh, this wonderful filmmaker. I just watched one of his that was fantastic uh, called A Hidden Life about an Austrian farmer who just could not take the oath to Hitler um, and so was terribly persecuted as a result. Malick is a, a wonderful sort of artistic director and he has a, a movie called The Thin Red Line, which you may have seen. It's about uh, the conquest of one of the islands in the Pacific during World War II and the way that he portrays this island at the beginning, before the, the, uh, the soldiers have arrived, it is paradise. 
and once the soldiers have arrived, even the natives who live on the island are no longer in that sort of paradisical state that they now fight with one another and argue with one another. It's as if civilization has come and corrupted paradise. And you know, the, the, the truth be told, there is a certain strain of anti-civilization motif in the Bible. Uh, there's a, an element of it. Israel often fares better in the wilderness than she fares when she's in cities. Lot's mistake, if you're in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 13, when he and Abraham split up, is that he's attracted over toward the cities of the plain and keeps uh, you know, inching more and more in that direction, and it's the cities that corrupt him. If you're reading the book of Hosea, when uh, Israel has departed from God and God says, I'm going to call you back to myself, he says, I'm going to take you back to the wilderness. It's, you know, it's filled with marriage imagery. And what it's basically saying is, I'm going to take you back to the place where we honeymooned. Sinai is where they were married, and the wilderness is where they honeymooned. And he says, I'm going to take you back there and woo you again. Characters in the Bible like Moses and Elijah and David and Jesus and even Paul need a wilderness experience before they enter into their ministries there. These are, are people who sometimes find God better in the wilderness than they do in uh, civilization. The truth is, though, that ultimately the Bible does not find humanity's problem to be geographical. It's spiritual. That's where the Eden story is so unique. What is the paradise that is lost in the lost paradise of Eden. Eden is a story of dependence. In Eden, the couple is portrayed as having this perfect dependence and intimacy, really in three different directions. On the one hand, they, uh, they have a perfect dependence upon creation. Where they are in creation is they are the, the ones who tend a garden. It's not the drudgery that will come after the fall. Where they are in, in this spot is they tend the garden, they have to eat to live, they're dependent upon the tree of life, they are in perfect dependence upon creation. They're also in perfect dependence upon one another. And that's symbolized by the fact that they're naked, but they're not ashamed. There's this kind of unashamed intimacy between the two that a marriage captures. And then they're perfectly dependent upon God, too. So much so that when you start off in uh, chapter 3 of Genesis, there's the fall of the couple, but then in verse 8 it says, God's coming down to walk with them as was his custom in the cool of the day. Here we have a royal garden where God comes and walks around with the couple. I mean, the, the symbolism here is hard to miss, that this is a couple that lives in perfect dependence. Dependence is what it means in these first chapters of Genesis to be human. To be human is to rely on creation, to rely on one another, to rely on God. It's a dependence that the couple squandered because they wanted to be gods. Now this is something that's celebrated in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh defies the gods at every turn in his attempt to gain immortality and ultimately he actually does find his immortality in the city. Uruk that he built. And Genesis 1 through 11 is written in many respects to counter that vision of humanity. It is not a text that glorifies defiance of the gods. It's a text that glorifies submission to God, dependence upon God. And it ends with a city, the city of Babel, which is in Genesis' mind a mistake on humanity's part rather than a blessing. When we focus too much on our independence, we become detached from God. When we focus too much on our independence, we become estranged and even violent towards one another. When we focus too much on our independence, we end up treating creation not as a productive garden, but rather as something that we can run roughshod over, scarring it sometimes permanently. Much of the Bible is a story about finding our way back to Eden. The Bible is a story that, it's, it's not a coincidence that they place at the very beginning this notion of paradise lost and then narrate over the chapters that follow this attempt to find our way back to Eden. 
It occurs again and again. It's there. Um, it, it's, it's what the flood story is, frankly. The flood story is when the world is full of violence, the, the world is depicted as the, the slate wipe clean and will begin again with Noah. Noah, a man of the soil who plants a vineyard and so forth. But the problem is that it goes south just as quickly with Noah in the story as it does with the first couple. It's a story of paradise lost that longs to find paradise once again, to arrive at a place like the place that Isaiah describes. Isaiah in chapter 58 says, The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. It's the famous image that you've all heard before from Isaiah 11. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is Isaiah's image. This is Isaiah's longing for that restoration of the garden, for that restoration of paradise in which violence has been turned aside and all of creation lives in harmony. It's the image that's cast, frankly, in the heavenly city in the last chapters of Revelation. There are strong connections between those verses in Revelation 21 and 22 when it talks about this heavenly city. Well, what's it like? Well, it, it's full of jewels. It's full of trees. Violence has been pushed aside from it. And what is it that's there in the midst of the garden? It describes the tree of life as being there. What all of the, the scriptures are pointing towards is they're making their way from this initial paradise that was lost and trying to make its way toward this paradise we hope to regain in the future in Revelation 21 and 22. And the question then becomes, so how do we get there? Because we are now living in the, the, the shadow of that lost paradise. How is it? that we make our way back to our hopes in paradise. What, how, what is our task now to be doing toward the accomplishment of that heavenly city? And that's what we're going to talk about next week. So we, uh, we have arrived at the time where we can open things up for questions. Um, and uh, Becky has a, uh, uh, a microphone, uh, which I have heard was lovingly called the Oprah mic. Uh, so that it, I, I don't have a card to give to everyone today, so sadly there are no prizes uh, here, um, but other than copies of my book that you can purchase. I think they sell it in lots of 20 and 40 um, is the way that that works. Uh, but, so what questions might you have this morning? Can I bring the mic too today? <laughs> you want? All right. Because I don't ever have to use it then. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll okay, okay. Stay. Oh, that's even better. Yeah, just like a, yeah. Oh, no, see, I don't watch Oprah. I don't know these things. And the old people. Okay, so do you think it's the case? I was listening to the, all the various versions of Paradise that it's inevitable, that it's fantastic, it's wonderful, but it's always lost. You know, what's so interesting about, um, uh, in the Bible, th there's no question, uh, that paradise is, is always lost. Um, the Bible has a different vision of this, though, than the Mesopotamians do. One of the, the great differences between uh, the Mesopotamians and the Bible is that in Mesopotamian society, things are always getting better and better. Whereas in the Bible, there's this strong sense that things are not getting better. Uh, that things are broken and things are not as they should be. And so in these creation stories that you have uh, in uh, Mesopotamia, what they're celebrating is the move toward civilization. And so, uh, you know, first the gods are doing all the work, and then eventually the gods are tired of doing the work, so they, they create human beings to do it. They all have this flood story in there about, you know, putting in mortality, but they're all moving toward cities. 
and even the, uh, the sort of Enki and Enforsag that I mentioned where uh, Enki's life-giving waters create this garden. Truthfully, the garden is only part of what he makes because he also makes this city of Dilmun. And so they think of cities as sort of the pinnacle of human existence. So they think things are getting better and better. And if you just think about it in, in terms of political reality, Assyria and Babylon and Persia, they are growing more and more mighty and conquering more and more vast swaths of the world. While if you're in Israel, you're the recipient of those conquests of Assyria and of Babylon. And so in their minds, things are, are not going the way that they should. So Mesopotamia doesn't have quite that same idea of a paradise lost. Now it does have a, a, a similar sort of strong uh, ethos as is in the Bible of a notion that former times were different than they are now. And so one of the ways they express that, it's actually similar to the way the Bible does it, is they will talk about this list of kings who reign for thousands of years. And it's a way, a kind of a literary way of saying they were different than we are today, which is, you know, in part what's going on in Genesis 1 through 11 when you have those, like Methuselah living 969 years or uh, that sort of thing. This is one of their ways of saying they were different times were different than the way that they are now. And so there is that element of uh, former times were different. And you, you might wonder if there's an element of lost immortality because the only way for you to be immortal is to be the survivor of the flood and you have to live separately out on this island, uh, you know, where Dilmun or, you know, probably what they really mean is the island of Bahrain, uh, you know, out in the Persian Gulf today is the place where you can be immortal, but to be immortal, you can't live with the rest of the humans. You have to be over there. So there's, there's a, a hint of it in the Bible. It's not a hint. It is absolutely pervasive. Every reflex of the Eden story is one of an Eden that's lost. Right. So the question was, uh, what about in the New Testament when Jesus has this, one day you'll be with me in paradise? Uh, there's definitely this, uh, this element in which um, the, uh, what lies in store is treated as that you know, recapturing of the, the earthly paradise is transferred to a heavenly paradise. And so Jesus is going to say, you know, this, is, this is what lies in store for us. And you know, it's it's interesting, if you did a Venn diagram, there'd be a lot of overlap because they don't, they don't exactly describe the, the, what lies in store for the future of humanity as something that lies in store for humanity in heaven. Instead, it's a renewed heaven and earth. And so it, it certainly seems like you know, that, that Jesus is saying, you're gonna be with me in paradise, but that's not the end of the story. When you get to um, you know, many passages in the New Testament, what they seem to be describing is God recreating the earth, except it's recreated in a way that it captures that full Eden rather than being now fallen. And it talks about all the things that won't be there. And so there won't be impurity. There won't be violence. What there will be is God's presence. Uh, there's no need for sun or moon because God is the light there. There will be God's temple among us. Um, you know, which is uh, that, that symbol of his presence and the tree of life uh, that's there, the way of God sustaining us. So, yeah, I think that um, the, the future images of the Bible capture that sort of notion of paradise regained. Um, absolutely. Other questions? We can hear everyone here, but I want to make sure the people in the live stream at home can hear the question too. So, okay. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. I've written down so many notes. It's, it's really great. It's such a stark um, image in Revelation when um, the holy city comes down, you know, a city coming down rather than Eden being restored. And, um, you know, I, I even have heard people about talking about, you know, it's really the city where things happen and not the garden. And the, it, it seems such a contrast to the theme of Eden and paradise restored. And I'm wondering whether you could say a few words about that. You know, I, I do find it fascinating because there's some transference of imagery that happens that, uh, you know, w when we first deal with Eden, 
Uh, it's just this garden, and you think of it actually as being the garden in the midst of a plain. In fact, the, one of the possibilities for um, the etymology of the word Eden is the Sumerian word Edenu, which means a plain or a, a step. You know, that's that area that's kind of on the edge of a uh, fertile area. Um, the, I think probably that's outweighed by the other etymological possibility, which is the word Eden, which has to do with luxury and bounty and fertility. It could be that the author has a little bit of both in mind, but you, you start off with this notion of a garden, but uh, Ezekiel, every time that he refers to Eden, he includes the notion of the mountain of God. And so uh, his depiction of Eden is more of Eden that's there as a, a place that's on a mountain, and then you also get, just as you said, um, this notion that Eden seems to transfer some of its properties to the holy city. And so in some respects, it's almost as if Jerusalem becomes the new Eden. Um, and I, I wonder if the connection between those two is that the, the notion of Pardes, when it begins in Persian, is of a walled royal garden. And so if they're not borrowing some of that imagery of the walled garden transferring over to the walled city, that it's not just the throne of the king that's inside of the garden, now it's the temple, the throne of God that's there inside of the city. And so when you get to Revelation, it strikes me that it includes some of both images that it has, uh, on the one hand, it's, it's definitely the heavenly city. It talks about all the gates, and they measure it with the golden rod, and you have the, you know, the, uh, the, the various uh, jewels and so forth that make up everything. And yet, what's in there, in this holy city, it talks about the tree of life and the waters that come, which are both more botanical kinds of ideas. Um, and so, and I actually think that this is... Um, it's something, obviously, so much of Scripture weighs heavily upon Tolkien, but if you're a, a Tolkien fan, these kinds of images come up so much in his writing. So, for example, in Minas Tirith, um, you know, it talks about the waters that are there and this tree that you want to be restored, which is the symbol that the, the monarchy has been restored when Aragorn returns to the throne. And if you look at you know, some of his other kinds of writings, like the Silmarillion or the Unfinished Tales, he has that same idea in there, is that there's these uh, towers with lights, and there's uh, these trees that are there, and there's always the waters in this kind of paradise that's there in the West, uh, as he describes it. So I, I think what they're doing is they're borrowing some of that Edenic imagery and now making it a place that's fit not just for a couple, but for everyone uh, to live in the city, but they retain some of those images and motifs of the tree that's there and the waters that are there uh, along with it. So. I think we probably have time for one more, if anybody has one. <laughs> so I'll close with this thought that this is a pervasive concern in the scriptures, is that how do we make our way back to Eden? And it's, it's not as obvious as the notion is that we should just be good gardeners. Certainly, that's something near and dear to my heart. I'm the descendant of people who uh, were in love with plants. Sadly, our yard is built uh, directly upon the mantle of the earth. And so if you'd like to see the mantle, just scrape about an inch of the, the remaining topsoil that we have in our yard, and you'll find it. Um, the amount of years I shaved off the end of my life by trying to dig holes to put bushes into uh, in our yard is, is well nigh legendary. But it's not just gardening and creation care that restores this Eden. It's part of it. But there's also going to be a part of restoring all three of those relationships that were lost in Eden. It's a matter of caring for the earth, and then that gets expressed in other ways as caring for one another, and all of those are vital parts of having the proper relationship with God. You can do it from every direction, that when we have our relationship right with God, then we treat others with care and respect, and we treat creation properly. When we begin to treat those other things properly, it moves us toward a closer relationship with God. How do we begin to restore that Eden? That's what we'll start to talk about next week. So. I was just going to say, could you give a preview of next week? And you just did. So. Indeed, I can. Yes. I mean, maybe just like a thumbnail sketch real quick of what will be to come next week. So, so what we're going to talk about next week is we're going to look at how uh, the Torah, how the first five books of the Bible begin to sketch out, even in their legal materials,
this is how people who fear the Lord will care for creation, will interact even with the animals that they own, and ultimately with people. Um, how do we live out creation in uh, just the laws that kind of cast a vision for what God expects of humanity in those first books? All right. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming out this morning. Thank you, Jeff, for, for sharing with us. We'll look forward to the next two weeks. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, Jeff will be around for a few minutes after. And, um, and so thank you very much. <clears throat>